The voice of Bing Crosby was heard by more people than that of any other singer who ever lived. He was the most successful recording star of all time, the most popular radio entertainer of his day, Hollywood's biggest box office attraction for a full decade, and a television superstar whose Christmas specials were an American institution. With all, he was a sportsman, a hunter, a fisherman, and a relaxed, charming, simple family man. Or so it appeared. But since his death, another different image has emerged. The image of a man who's been called cold, ambitious, cruel and mean. A lot of people think that Bing was a loner, but Bing was a very loyal friend. I don't think he was consciously mean ever. I think he was a selfish man. He was not a warm person. He was very hard to know and very hard to talk to. He was a tough guy, and I'll tell you how tough he was. You could make one wrong move and he'd never speak to you again, and he'd never let you know why. I liked him toward the end. I don't, I don't, I can't say I loved him. But I liked him. Harry Lillis Crosby was born in this house in Tacoma, Washington, on May the 3rd, 1903, the fourth of seven children of Kate and Harry Crosby, a Roman Catholic couple of Irish descent. I know that my grandfather, on my dad's side, was uh, uh, kind of a little leprechaun of a guy who, who enjoyed a drink now and then, and he played the mandolin and sang funny songs and told funny stories, and he was kind of a happy-go-lucky type little Irish guy, and, and my grandmother was very stern. The Crosby household was a matriarchy. Kate, the mother, controlled the finances, imposed the discipline, meted out the corporal punishment, and saw to the children's religious upbringing. In 1906, the family moved to Spokane, Washington, and it was there that Harry Lillis acquired the nickname Bing that was to stay with him for the rest of his life. He was so named after a comic book character who, like himself, had remarkably protuberant ears. With his siblings, young Bing attended a Jesuit school, and for some time, his mother had ambitions for him to become a priest. He, however, had other ideas, and in 1920, went to Gonzaga University to read law. By then, though he'd had no formal musical instruction, he'd been playing for two years in a school band called the Juicy Seven. I played the drums and sang the choruses and the vocals. And the... I followed bands since I was a kid. Uh, used to haunt the record store like kids do now. When the Juicy Seven folded, a college friend, Al Rinker, asked Crosby to join another band, the Musical Aiders, which became so successful that Crosby dropped out of college to make music his career. He also, and with equal passion, took up golf. This was the age of prohibition, a carefree era that became rather less carefree when the Musical Aiders split up in their turn, whereupon Rinker and Crosby went west to seek their fortunes in Los Angeles. Out where they say, let us be gay, I'm going home. In Los Angeles, where they arrived in 1925, Rinker and Crosby joined a traveling show called The Syncopation Idea and toured with it for 18 months. During this time, far away from his mother's rigid discipline, Crosby began to chase girls and to drink heavily. Well, that's where the boo 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 came from, you know. He worked down here at the Coconut Grove when he started, and uh, he was he used to love to love to take a little nip now and then if he had a few too many nips he'd just, he'd just forget the lyrics and go ba 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 boo ba 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 boo ba 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 boo and it was famous and uh, he was a big smash down there with his boo ba ba boo what are you fellas moaning about and at times I remember him singing you're nobody sweetheart and I was somebody holding him up to the mic and he was and still it sounded pretty good. He couldn't enunciate, his words were slurred, but he still sang with a feeling, musical feeling. I've heard stories about him since then. You know, the one place I went, I, there was a little old lady that, came, that uh, called in on a talk show I saw and said she played piano for him, and the only reason the piano was out there was so that he could hang on to it. <laughs> That's how ripped he'd get, see. A life of wine, women, and song, in fact, with the song paying for the other delights. She's just the kind of a girl you want. The Crosby Rinker duet played in vaudeville, made their first record, I've Got the Girl, and were hired by Paul Whiteman, one of the great jazz band leaders of the day. In 
In January 1927, after minor triumphs in Chicago and elsewhere, Crosby and Rinker opened at the Paramount Theatre here in New York with the Whiteman Band and flopped. The band was popular, the singers were not, and Whiteman dropped them from the show. But at this low point, a mutual friend suggested they should team up with a singer and songwriter named Harry Barris, and having nothing much better to do, they did. And so the Rhythm Boys were formed and were immediately successful. Mind you, they weren't particularly industrious. They spent much of their time in pursuit of alcohol, women and golf balls, and they only had a repertoire of about 12 songs. But they each earned $150 a week, and when Whiteman sent them out on a tour of the vaudeville circuit, they did so well that in 1929, he invited them to rejoin the band for a trip across America in a private train, which stopped at various places en route so the occupants could give concerts and radio broadcasts. The journey culminated in Hollywood, where the band and the Rhythm Boys were to make the king of jazz. Crosby was to have sung a solo in this film, but unfortunately he landed in jail on a drunk driving charge, and Whiteman punished him by giving the solo to someone else. So Crosby appeared only as one of the Rhythm Boys. Oh, these revelers. Oh, some quartet on the air. It really doesn't matter. When the film was finished, the Rhythm Boys left Whiteman, preferring to stay on the West Coast, where the opportunity seemed greater. It was an amicable parting, and Whiteman later said of Crosby, the outstanding thing about Bing, the more successful he became, the smaller his head got and the bigger his heart grew. Well, success is relative. For the Rhythm Boys at that time, it meant an engagement at the famous Coconut Grove. And for Crosby, the chance to become a solo singer and to make local radio broadcasts. I think of you with every breath, I say. As Crosby himself put it, his songs now began to have a cry in them. Very quickly, he became the star of the show. But it costs more than I can pay. Without you, I can't make my way. I surrender, dear. Jazz musicians are not too enamored of singing, as a general rule, uh, unless it's Louis Armstrong kind of singing, which is musical, it's jazz singing. Uh, but Bing had it. He had a quality that was instantly discernible. I surrender, dear. Just one more chance. He loved to sing. He'd get up in the morning and I'd hear him next door sing all morning, get in the car, we'd be driving maybe 100, 200 miles, sing all the way. Just one more chance. He was musically sang in tune, and he not only in tune in the uh, legitimate academic sense, but in tune with the, with the music, in tune with the feel of the song. Uh, he had a beat. He understood jazz, and he sang like a jazz singer, not like a Jolson, and not like any of the singers before him. He was a new voice. January because I'm in love oh, love thy neighbor he rehearsed so much and so long that within the framework of that perfection he could absolutely relax he would throw in a line that wasn't there he could uh, change the content of it so that it would be the same but sometimes it would be a total surprise to you so that you'd start laughing because it was brand new to you. But all that was in the framework of very, very hard work. Bing, had he had a longer range of a voice, if he'd had more top, let's say, the bottom was pretty good, he might have gone on to other things. But I think Bing concentrated on that particular area because that was what he knew and loved and where he excelled. So America moved into the Depression years, a fearful time for most people, but not for popular singers like Crosby, purveyors of optimistic songs which at least hinted of better things being on the way. When skies are cloudy and gray, they're only gray for a day. So wrap your troubles in dreams and dream your troubles once you get to be a big star, you don't take too many chances anymore. And Jazz is taking chances. He couldn't be bad if he tried. I mean, I don't like White Christmas particularly. It's not what you'd call jazz singing, but he did it well. He did it his own way. He was seminal. He started a whole new thing. He was all by himself. 
and uh, he had a host of imitators, all the way from Perry Como on, I would say even Sinatra was influenced. Dean Martin sounds like him to this day. Got, oh, you haven't got, got, oh, you haven't got, got, oh, you haven't got, got, an artist is a man who's found out who he is and does that, and it's not like anyone else. He owes nobody anything. I don't think being owed any singer that I ever heard of. Meanwhile, back at the Coconut Grove, Crosby met and later married a rising young movie star named Dixie Lee. Mom was great. She, uh, she was a really warm, wonderful, very shy person, too shy to be in show business. She was, she was a good singer and a, and a good dancer and an actress, but she hated every minute. It's just scared her to death every time she went out on stage. Bing and Dixie were married on September the 29th, 1930, and set up home here in a house lent to them by a friend. Theirs was hardly an ideal start to marital bliss. Crosby was drinking heavily and besides was inclined to lead his social life away from the home, gambling and golfing and generally carousing with the lads. Within a few months, a couple had separated and Dixie had announced to the press that though the parting was amicable, they simply couldn't live happily together. Crosby, however, persuaded her to change her mind and stay with him. As a Catholic and one who, throughout his life, always went to Mass on Sunday, come hell or high water or raging hangover, he couldn't contemplate divorce, and besides, he didn't want to lose her. So he promised to stop drinking, and he did. But alas, as he became more abstemious, Dixie became less so, and in a few years, it was apparent that she was an alcoholic. I would never in any way, shape, or form say that my father made my mother an alcoholic. That can't be done. If, if you're an alcoholic, you're an alcoholic because you drink. My mother was a tremendously shy person who needed an over amount of demonstrative affection, and she was in love with and married to a guy who couldn't show a normal amount. So there was that chasm. Crosby's marriage survived, albeit somewhat precariously, but the Rhythm Boys, as a trio, did not. I hear your name. Crosby was fired from the Coconut breath. Grove for missing several I engagements, am. but it's possible that he wanted to leave both the place and the trio anyway, for as Al Rinker said. Now, Max Sennett came over a lot, and he, uh, he wanted Bing to do some shorts the for the Max Sennett, for some shorts, which Bing did. And that was about the time, after he started doing these things, that the Rhythm Boys broke up and we disbanded. We, he went with Max Sennett and whatever he was doing, and I went my way. We'll be so happy there. Where oh, no. How did Ben Crosby get in there? What happened to the man strapped to the boiler? Well, how should I know? As the years roll by, when your golden hair has turned to gray, I'll be loving you, same old way. You'll be mine forever and today in my hideaway where the blue of the night meets the gold of the day. Someone waits for me. And that, of course, was destined to become Crosby's signature tune, and this was the first time he was filmed singing it. Mind you, he didn't devote himself solely to the movies. He also signed a lucrative recording contract with Brunswick Records. Learn to prove If you want to win your heart You came I was alone I should have known you were temptation. I'm an old cow hand from the Rio Grande. But my legs ain't bold and my cheeks ain't tan. And around the same time, he went to New York to make his debut on national radio. Well, well, well you're Groucho Marx, or I'm greatly mistaken. Glad to know you, greatly. <laughs> How's Mrs. Mistaken and all the little mistakes? Oh, well, it's very simple, Jack. You, you said you were 39 years old, so I gave you $39. Hmm. The radio shows, a mixture of song and comedy, were an immediate hit and attracted some notable guest stars. Bing boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Would you like to know how old I'm really going to be? In New York in 1932, Crosby first met Bob Hope 
Obviously, they got on well because they immediately took to insulting each other in public, and especially on their rival radio shows. That was uh, all in great fun, and we used to, he used to say, Bing used to say to me, he said, uh, don't do any ball jokes for me, you know. And then he was in London one time, Bing walked out on this radio show, and I heard him say, boy, if I had known this, this many people around, I'd have worn my toupee. And I fell off the chair because Bing always said to me, please don't say anything about my hair, you know. What should we play for? Well, I don't know. Who do you know? Let's play for one of my old toupees. <laughs> well, such occasional ad libs are all very well, but on radio, Crosby needed a professional writer to provide the wit. Well, when I first met him, he was leaning on a piano doping horses, and Jimmy Dorsey's band was playing the eight-bar release to a song. And... I thought, well, he's going to blow this one. And just as it was time for him to enter, he stuck the pencil under his ear, walked to the mic, and came in right on the beat. And at the end of it, I was introduced to him. And he shook hands, because glad to know you, Carol. Lots of luck. And he walked away, which I later learned was his most friendly greeting. Was Bing really relaxed? No. People who worked in the house said that after an evening of whatever it was that kept him at his desk, they would find a whole pile of broken pencils. Anger, whatever it was, people don't just break pencils for fun unless they're going to sharpen both ends of them. Maybe it was the sheer pressure of seeming casual and easygoing all the time that made him so tense. Or maybe it was just work. By now, he was deeply involved in radio, recordings and films. He made the big broadcast of 1932 for Paramount, who promptly signed him to a five-picture deal, the first of the five being College Humor, which co-starred Mary Carlyle. Class is dismissed. Hold these. I... Oh, don't get excited. It's just part of the Omicron initiation. Well, I know, but I... Oh, don't be that way. You love it. Going my way? Uh, it was Bing's hello. first part that he played other than himself in a picture before he'd always played Bing Crosby. And I remember that Bing, you know, his ears used to stick out a little bit, and they would stick them back. And in one of the scenes, <laughs> this ear popped out, <laughs> and we were all hysterical. With his ears unglued, Crosby looked, as someone said, like a whippet in full flight. Later, when he was a star, he let them flap free, and nobody cared. And by the late 1930s, he was indeed a star. He was also a father four times over. His sons, Gary, Dennis and Philip, who were twins, and Lindsay, having been born between 1933 and 1938. Meanwhile, the Crosby Empire, like the Crosby family, was also expanding fast. His business affairs were such that he employed his three elder brothers and his father to look after them, for he was now one of the biggest names in entertainment. There were 85 Crosby fan clubs scattered throughout the world, and he received 10,000 letters a week. He made three films a year, presented a weekly radio show, and fitted in regular recording sessions. In addition, his passion for golf led in 1937 to what was to become the annual Bing Crosby tournament at Pebble Beach, where movie stars played by invitation only. He also acquired a racetrack at Del Mar on the Pacific coast, owned a baseball team, the Pittsburgh Pirates, and frequently went hunting and fishing with his friend Phil Harris. Everything he did, he did well. He could use a shotgun well. He was a very good fly fisherman, excellent. He categorized people. He had friends for golf, he had friends for fishing, he had friends for hunting. They never crossed, they never met. In the whole time I worked for Bing, I was only in his house three times. Each time of that, those three times, it was to use the bathroom. It's true. Crosby put great value on privacy, both for himself and his family, and yet, paradoxically, he was not above using his sons in public appearances, on which occasions they presented an affectionate and united front. To the world at large, the Crosbys were the ideal Hollywood family, a happy, self-contained little unit. But the facts were rather different. Crosby was a repressive father, inflicting harsh rules and even harsher punishment on his four sons. The reason for that probably lay in his own childhood. His mother believed firmly in iron discipline and corporal punishment, and was besides a devout Catholic who at one time wanted young Bing to become a priest. Crosby reacted to this background, first by rebelling against it and becoming a boozer and a womanizer, and then by repenting and embracing his mother's stern Victorian principles, which in turn he tried to impose on his own children. So there emerged another side to the affable, easygoing crooner, that of the cold paterfamilias. His sons resented and rejected this side of their father, but it's charitable to assume that he believed he was acting in their interests, and the fact that his 
over strict methods had the very opposite effect to the one intended and caused his sons when they grew up to behave as wildly and as drunkenly as he had done in his own youth is sad and ironic but by no means unique his motives were all good he wanted to raise kids that weren't Hollywood kids. That scared the hell out of him when he saw uh, uh, these kids around that were banging up cars and getting in trouble and all their dads would do is hand them more money and a new car. And he used to say, I don't want any Hollywood kids around here. Everything was punishment, 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 punishment. Uh, it made me and my brothers, I think, uh, very defensive guy cats growing up because, because I never can remember ever concentrating on trying to do something right. I spent my whole life trying to keep from doing anything wrong, see. And that, 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 that makes you uptight a lot of the time. The Crosby household was strictly, if not devoutly, Roman Catholic, thanks to Dixie, who, though not a member of that church herself, ensured that her sons were and sent them to Mass every Sunday. So we used to have a rule in the Catholic Church where you had to fast uh, from 12 midnight the night before, before you went to communion in the morning. And I used to stand in the kitchen about quarter day before we go to church in the morning, and there he'd be, and he'd stand with a big cup of coffee with cream and sugar and drinking it down, see? Now, I never said anything to him. But I used to wonder about that. And I'd look and I'd look, and finally one day he, he saw me looking, and he knew what was in the, in, going through my head, see. And he took a sip of the coffee, he looked at me, and he said, uh, special dispensation. But after going to the Catholic school for a while and up through high school, I kind of started getting the same feeling about God and my father. I felt th th they seemed to be the same kind of person to me. Everybody knew two people, God and him, see. But the main reason I never really ran away from home was because I figured everybody knew him. And I'd be back like this, and then he'd really kick the hell out of me. So I didn't want to get into that. They were kind of wild, like all kids are, you know. And uh, every summer, Bing had a big ranch up at Elko, Nevada. And the minute they'd finish school, he'd put them up there and put one on a buck rake, or one doing this, or one doing that. And the boys would be kind of discontented because, you know, during vacation, they wanted to do a little playing. See, he, he was the old school, and he wanted to mold us, or at least me. He wanted to mold us into what he wanted. And, and he just didn't realize that that doesn't work with people. In public, however, the family tensions were not allowed to show. With the advent of World War II, the boys helped their father to sell war bonds, of which he eventually disposed of 14 and a half million. Being nearly 40, Crosby was not called upon for military service, and so continued his career, co-starring, for example, with Fred Astaire in Holiday Inn, and incidentally singing White Christmas, which was to become the most popular song in the world. But he also toured both America and Europe to entertain the troops. In 1944, he appeared in England, too payless, a toupee perhaps being deemed too frivolous for wartime. And never more roam and make the San Fernando Valley my home. And make the San Fernando Valley my home. Don't throw bouquets at me, and don't please my folks too much. And in the war years too, he teamed up with another useful singer, Frank Sinatra, to sell war bonds. People will say we're in love. But the most successful partnership was with Bob Hope. Keep moving, you're a hell of a target. Together they amused the troops and made the first of an almost legendary series of films. Was there a lot of ad-libbing in those road pictures? <laughs> you know, I had a big staff of writers because I had just started my Pepsi and a radio show. And uh, I used to give them the scripts. And they were young, all young college kids and everything. And they'd write things in there. And I'd take them into Bing and I'd say, what do you think of this? And we'd say, yeah. And uh, we'd go on the set and throw these extra things. And the director would look with his eyes wide open and say, what was that? What was that? Said, well, did you like it? And usually they liked it, you know, because uh, and, uh, there, was, there was that feeling of spontaneity on the set, which was marvelous. And it bothered the original writers. In fact, they walked on the set one day, and I said, if you hear one of your lines, yell bingo. <laughs> and it bothered the hell out of them until the picture was released. And then, of course, the picture was a smash. And from then on, it was all smiles. Hold it. I think we got one of the Cherry Brothers on there. Yeah, well, give them plenty of slack. Just let it out. Just let it out. We'll have them up here in a minute. You don't have me down there. Step into the office. Come in. 
Mm-hmm. Boy, I don't know what I'm going to have to do later, or brawl. How do you like him? I'd like him in the boat. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. Uh, hey, he's still alive. He won't give up. He must be a Republican. Oh! There were to be six more road films with Hope and Dorothy L'Amour, each of them so popular that the whole world felt it knew Bing Crosby. But the world was wrong. Well, Bing was hard to know, you know. I mean, Bing was the type of guy that uh, if you introduced him to somebody, he could tell right away whether he wanted to uh, become close to him or not. Bing more or less was a loner, you know. I don't think he ever learned how to react to people because before he did, he was getting rich, and I think he was very scared of people trying to take advantage of him. He was one of these people, you run into him every once in a while, who doesn't know how to be gracious. Occasionally tries, but doesn't come off that way. And was there anything you disliked or didn't like so much about him? No, no, uh, I could understand it. You know, for instance, they had a big uh, dinner in my honor uh, here at uh, the Friars, and everybody was concerned because Bing didn't show up. But I knew why he didn't show up, because he didn't like to go out in public without his hair on, you know? And that's the only reason. And when I, when I had a, a preview of a picture I made of Bachelor in Paradise over in London, I didn't even ask him to go. And one day on the way to she Shepperton in the car, he said, I'll go uh, if I can just appear on the stage. And he appeared on the stage for 40 minutes at the preview, and of course delighted those British fans, but he didn't want to go out front and, uh, and have somebody call him Baldy or something, you know. Not many people called Crosby Baldy, and they regretted it if they did, but he was certainly a wary and unpredictable man. I cast Bing as a priest. This is radio, remember. Bing says, you're not going to get a round collar on me, Buster. Two weeks later, it was announced that he was going to do Going My Way. In this film, directed by Leo McCary, Crosby played his most successful role, that of Father O'Malley, a parish priest. I'll be St. Louis High. Hear me, how are you? Fine. Glad to see you. How long is it since we've seen each other? Four years. Oh, five, anyway. Has it been that long? Yes. Pardon me. Father Fitzgibbon? This is my old friend, Father O'Dowd. How are you, Father Fitzgibbon? We've been friends since we were knee-high to a nibbler. He was our local Huckleberry Finn. <laughs> <laughs> Laugh and the world laughs with you, he used to say. Cry and you cry all by yourself. One of his co-stars in the film was the singer, Risa Stevens. He never touched one drink throughout the whole film. It was a very serious situation with him, which makes me believe that he, in essence, he, um, he saw himself as that priest because... I believe that Bing, at one time, as a young man, must have thought that perhaps he might want to be a priest. Because of the film's religious and therefore slightly controversial theme, Buddy De Silva, a studio executive, arranged a preview for a Catholic bishop. Afterwards, the bishop rose and, without a word, left the room. Suddenly Bing said, I don't know. I have a feeling they didn't like it. In comes Buddy De Silva. And he said he was ecstatic, absolutely ecstatic. He can't wait for this. He said he, it never occurred to him that Bing could do this and that it's so beautiful. Yes, he's all for this film. You haven't told me yet, Chuck. Why did you stop writing? I did tell you, my last letter. Which letter was that? Guess that must have been the letter you didn't get. You wrote to me in, in Rome, in Florence, Naples, Vienna, Budapest. What happened, Chuck? Chuck, what happened? Father oh, Chuck. Crosby's Oscar for Best Actor in 1944, his only Oscar, was Thank one of seven that went to Going My Way. I couldn't be more surprised if I won the Kentucky Derby, really. After such success, inevitably, Father O'Malley prayed again in the Bells of St. Mary's with Ingrid Bergman. Not nearly such a good film, but another hit. Myself, may I tell you that I'm happy I've been selected as pastor of St. Mary's. <laughs> Working in a parish where there's a parish school is going to prove a new experience for me, and 
and I'm sure a very interesting one. The vast majority of Crosby's films, including six of the seven road pictures, were made here at Paramount Studios. For a man who appeared, one way or another, in a hundred movies, Crosby was remarkably self-deprecating about his own ability. I've been described as a light comedian, he said, and that's just about what I am. Well, on the whole, that was true, but I think it was a matter of choice. I believe he decided what his limitations were and determined to remain within them. Now, commercially, this was probably a wise move, but artistically, it was limiting. When, reluctantly, he was persuaded to step out of character, as in The Country Girl, he showed a versatility and depth of talent that probably surprised even himself. But as he may well have argued, why take the risk of stepping out of character too often when the public revealed time after time that all it really wanted was the familiar, relaxed Bing Crosby? The public may not always be right, but when it names you America's most popular actor for 10 years, it can hardly be ignored. We're busy doing nothing, working the whole day through, trying to find lots of things not to do. We're busy going nowhere, isn't it just a crime? We like to be unhappy, but we never do have the time. We're full of glee, my buddy and me. We're happy all day through. You'll always see us laughing ha, like little boys. We're so full of joys, and that's why we say to you, we're on our way. Wait till the sun shines, Nellie, when the clouds go drifting by. We will be so happy, Nellie. Don't let me hear you sighing. In the early 1950s, Crosby was at the height of his career, earning at least a million dollars a year from films, weekly radio shows and records. In one year alone, he sold 8 million discs and earned $400,000. Now, honey, don't be late. Bye. In the sweet bye and bye. His business enterprises were equally lucrative. Bing Crosby Productions, with offices on Sunset Boulevard, dealt in property, the development of recording tape, and frozen orange juice. But not all his ventures were successful. Well, we were in uh, several business deals, and we put $25,000 apiece in a an outfit called Lime Cola. We put a big sign in Road to Rio. You can see it today, a carnival scene where it said Lime Cola. We were gonna plug our own product. And before the picture was released, the product flopped. And we used to go to the, the, the previews and just look and turn our eyes away when that thing came on the screen. He was generous, in, especially financially. He was, he was very giving to charities and, and things like that. He was very careful with his money. But that's like everybody with a lot of money. He was down in the little village of Burlingame where we lived every day. So he knew the price of everything. And if he wanted to buy a baseball bat or whatever for one of the children, although we had everything, but if he felt he wanted to, he knew exactly where to go. Y you had lunch with him every week. Now, who paid? I'm sorry you brought that up. He never carried money. <laughs> so you paid? Certainly. <laughs> who else? <laughs> Well, not paying for lunch is, of course, a good way of remaining rich. Besides, Crosby was never extravagant. His sartorial style was, to say the least, sloppy, and his only regular self-indulgence was golf. Well, being at his top was, uh, was a fine golfer. He was champion of our club for three years. He used to walk, come into the studio with his shoes unlaced. And I would say, don't you have time at home to lace your shoes? He says, oh, I stopped off at the club and hit a bucket of balls. That's before he went to work in the morning. To keep us on the set, Paramount put a net on the set, but that we could drive balls in until uh, one of us, one, some, one of the members of the crew got too close and Bing hit him on his backswing. And uh, the fellow wasn't really hurt badly. He healed up in a couple of months, I think. But uh, that, that was the end of that. In 1950, it was rumored, and not for the first time, that Crosby and Dixie were to separate. Well, this was denied strongly by family and lawyers alike, but it does seem fairly clear that he'd had affairs with other women. Mom knew about him. I mean, she, she heard about him. She, she had a, a pretty good idea what was going on. Uh, when she would get loaded uh, and forget that I was in the room, some names would slip out, you know. I didn't know anything until one time a guy's, one of his, a couple of his friends were sitting around the house and forgot I was in the room again, and they, and they told a story about that concerned him and, a, and a, a lady of the evening. And I went, uh-huh. And then it kind of came to me that maybe those times when I was listening to my mother with the names, maybe they weren't so far-fetched as I thought. Maybe it wasn't all alcohol talking, you know. 
1952, Dixie developed cancer. Crosby was told of this, she was not. But still, he went to Europe to film Little Boy Lost, an apparently callous decision that was almost certainly prompted by the doctor, who suggested that if Crosby changed his plans, Dixie would realise how ill she was. Was she, do you think, still in love with your father right up until her death? Oh, I think so. Yeah. Certainly. I feel that it was a, it was a torturous thing for her, but she still was. So while Dixie lay ill, Crosby, pretending all was well, posed with his small co-star at the Paris Zoo. The tenderness he showed the boy in the film contrasted sharply with his attitude to his own family. I've reached a point in life where I'm not very keen about birthdays anymore, so I'm going to make you a present of my birthday. It is loud, monsieur. It's my birthday. I can do whatever I want with it, can I? Would you like it? Oh, yes, monsieur. When is it? Uh, 16th of July. October, November, December, January, February. No. I just happen to think of something. I can't do that. I've got to keep my birthday another year because some friends of mine have planned a great big party for me. It's a celebration. But I got a brother now. Let's see. When's my brother's birthday? We'll grab one of his. Huh? He's not very keen about birthdays either. It's in October. The 13th of October. Let's see what day it is today. Let's take a look here. It's the 12th. That's tomorrow. Wouldn't that be better? Do you think Monsieur would give it to me? Oh, well, we're going to call him just as soon as we get in Paris, huh? Crosby returned from Paris in October 1952 and Dixie, apparently much improved, arranged a surprise party for him. Soon afterwards, however, she had a relapse and died on November the 1st, the day of her 41st birthday. After Dixie died, he was very lonely. That was the time when I first met him. Uh, he had been going out with a lot of different ladies. One was Grace Kelly. <laughs> How they expect me to make these fast changes like this. In The Country Girl, co-starring with Grace Kelly, Crosby played an alcoholic singer trying to make a comeback. He was rewarded with another Oscar nomination for what was probably his finest acting performance. Oh, why don't they get me a dress reward for the money they're paying me? They could afford a dozen of them. Do you want me to talk to Cook about it? Yes, and find your aunt and tell him to stop that understudy from snooping around backstage. I come off just now and he's hovering there like a vulture just waiting for me to cave in. I'm sure if you talk to Mr. Dodd about it, he'd... You talk to him. Tell him to keep that guy out front. Get me some new tissue. That stuff is murder. I, I will right after rehearsal. Frank, I'm sorry I stepped on that line of yours in the depot scene. Well, that's all right. Think nothing of it. Just as I was so nervous. Nervous? What's to be nervous about? It's just another show. <laughs> Where would you ever find another star, sweet as that? What a wonderful guy. It was something quite different. It was a departure from anything he had done before. And in the beginning, he was rather uneasy about it. And uh, it showed he was tense and uh, nervous the first few days. But George Seaton uh, was a wonderful director and a very warm, understanding person. And I think put Bing at ease very quickly and very easily. And uh, it, uh, it all went very smoothly after that. Whatever his relationship with Grace Kelly, it can't have been too serious, for about this time Crosby fell in love with a 19-year-old starlet, a Texan named Catherine Grant. Now this was serious and also fraught. Four times they set a wedding date, four times it was cancelled. While this was going on, he filmed White Christmas, and one day, the finale having been shot that morning, director Michael Curtiz asked the stars to do it again for the King and Queen of Greece who were visiting the set. And Bing looked at me and he said, I won't be here. He said, I'll be over the wall, but I'm sure you'll be able to handle it brilliantly. <laughs> so there was Vera Ellen and Danny and I singing. Bing's voice was coming through, but uh, the king and queen of Greece never saw Bing. They just saw us. I think he just thought it was phony, and he didn't do those things. Merry Christmas! In 1956, Crosby co-starred once more with Grace Kelly in High Society, her swan song before blossoming forth as Princess Grace of Monaco. They sang a duet, True Love, that was so successful that Crosby named his yacht after the song. While I give to you 
Meanwhile, Crosby and Catherine Grant dithered on about marriage. He was 54, and she was five months younger than his eldest son, enough in itself to cause a girl to think twice. But also, the Crosby rules of marriage possibly made her consider deeply before accepting him. I think that Bing must have sat down and had a talk with her and said, now look, uh, I love you, and I want to get married, I want to be married to you, and I want to have children, but when I want to go, I've always been used to going. And if I go, because when they were married, uh, a lot of the times Bing wouldn't even tell her he was leaving. If he wanted to go someplace, he'd just back up and go. But anyway, they finally married in Las Vegas in October 1957. Catherine later said that he brought happiness and fun to her life, and she certainly seems to have contributed much needed warmth to his. She had a joy of life that was evident in everything that she did. He liked Southern girls, too. <laughs> she was the perfect thing to have happened to him at his time of life. She was very outgoing. She always had to have a mission, whether it was a film, whether it was his business, whether it was the children. And she kept him going, although he was merely an onlooker to her activities. And she had the knack of coming to his level and not him coming down to her level. She loved him very much, was very protective of him. Uh, even when she was so young, when they first married, she would dress in black so that she would look older, she felt, or uh, wear a kind of a hairdo that would be older. She wanted to be perfect for Bing, and it was not easy. It was not easy. He was not, no interesting man is easy to live with. And so she had a very hard way to go. With his second wife, Crosby reared a second family, Harry, Mary Frances, his only daughter, and Nathaniel, the latter being born in 1961, while his father was in England filming the last and weakest of the road films, The Road to Hong Kong. Uh, why do I always have to do the dangerous stuff? Just the nature of our relationship, dear boy. Yeah? Yes, one of us has the brains, one of us has the bra. Mm -hmm. Besides, this deal's gonna be a cinch. Everything's a cinch and I wind up on crutches. Don't I always get you the best medical attention available? Yeah, like that doctor you got me in Bombay last month. How was I going to know he was an elephant doctor? You should have known by the size of his thermometer. Yeah, it was a bit large. When he shook it, I was still on it. I think he used to be a pole vaulter or something. You don't have to tell me. Well, here we go. Contact. Come on here, little. Let's point him. Is there, is there an insurance machine around here anywhere? Oh, stop worrying. Everything's going to be all right. Happy landings, Buster. I don't know what you're so happy about. You're not mentioned in my will. Release the beat. Let's uh, go. Are we on instruments? Not only was a good light comedian, he loved working with me because he got low. He got, he got into the hokey comic, you know? And everybody said, boy, what you're doing at Crosby, you know, because he loved to play hokey, sloppy stuff because he had never done that. Mm. And then he was a high comedian, as you know. And he was also a marvelous straight man, as am I, because we know anybody that does comedy knows how you would like to have a line delivered to you for a comic effect. So that was a, that was a great thing. I think that's why the team worked good together and we were we were simpatico to each other while living with the bob hopes at cranbourne court in berkshire the crosby's acquired the ultimate american status symbol an english butler of positively woodhousean dimensions and lured him away to their home in san francisco he lived a very very quiet life you know he was basically a hunting shooting fishing kind of man and the minute he came in from the golf course at four o'clock he turned, as he came through the garage entrance, he passed by the front door, turned the lock, put the chain on the front door, and he'd sort of put us to bed for the day. They never, ever entertained hardly at all in their home. I mean, Bob Hope came for dinner once, Fred Astaire once. In fact, his closest friends were all, you know, like the tycoons of industry. For Crosby then, an ordered and peaceful domestic life. But his four oldest sons were finding things much tougher. Their own rowdiness and drunkenness had destroyed the successful singing act they'd formed. My other brothers and I, it's no secret, we've all had problems with alcohol and drugs at one time or another. But if he came to us and said, are you having a problem? And we said, no, everything's fine. He'd walk in a minute and go, OK, everything's fine. That's what he wanted to hear. When he heard that, then it was OK for him to walk, see? You see, what hurt Bing was he wanted it 
he wanted them to finish college, and not one of them finished college. And uh, I think that kind of hurt him. If you're a father and you have four boys and you have one that's gone wrong, you're heartbroken. If you have two, then it's an even sadder situation. When three boys hit the skids, well, I don't know what you do with this, but when you, the fourth one, and there are only four of them, I'm sure at three o'clock in the morning when there's no one to blame and no one to accuse, you have to look inward and think, you know, where did I go wrong? Once, just once, in an interview, Crosby himself admitted that he'd gone wrong with his first family. He gave them, he said, too much discipline and money, too little time and attention. To that, he could perhaps have added too little understanding. Gary Crosby remembered a rather chilling conversation he had with his father. We got to talking about one of my brothers was having a mental problem. And so he, we were talking and we were, the evening went on and as he got to the door that night, he turned around, he looked me dead in the eye and he wasn't faking. He said, how does anybody have a mental problem? And so I said, well, Dad, some of us just are not as strong as you are. And life scares the hell out of us. And when we get scared, we do some strange and funny things. When any crisis in their life, they turn to him immediately, and he did solve all the problems for them. The older, mellower Crosby was clearly a more tolerant father the second time around. He left the discipline to Catherine, and if you compare Gary's early recollections of his father with those of his half-brother Harry, 25 years his junior, it's like hearing about two entirely different men. I saw kids who could get angry. They'd still have to do what he said, but they were allowed to get angry about it and voice their displeasure. Uh, I saw kids that loved their father and weren't afraid of him as much as, as we were. Uh, they were more allowed to be themselves. Now, he was still a strict parent, and, and so was she, but they were more, it was a more human relationship. He used to uh, sneak me out of school, on, and uh, we'd go duck hunting Wednesday mornings. Four in the morning, we'd get up and we'd go out into the fields, and this is oh, about 300 miles north of San Francisco. And it would be a precious few hours. Well, was he a man who could easily show affection? Uh, no. No, actually. Uh, and I think one has to be sensitive to the times that, you know, when he says very quietly, uh, nice job, or good work, or, um, yeah, I love him, love him, you know. It, that you, you really pick that up, because uh, I, I've got to say, credit goes to my mother. I think she was one who really taught my father affection towards children. In 1964, Crosby's mother, the dominant influence in his life, died at the age of 91. He himself, now in his 60s, cut down on his workload. He made few films of note, although one, Robin and the Seven Hoods, starring that mutual admiration society, the Sinatra clan, had a certain curiosity value. And our subject for tonight is the most evil of them all. Who that? I, I mean, who's that? Alcohol. Mr. Booze. Mr. Booze. Mr. Booze. Mr. Booze. Mr. B-double-O. Well, Crosby was the man to tell you about it, although booze had not been his problem for many years. But no doubt he called on past experience to play the drunken doctor in his last film in 1965, a drab remake of the John Ford classic Stagecoach. His career now was winding down, and his life revolved far more around his family and his various homes. They had three homes in Mexico. They had the enormous ranch. They had a home in Pebble Beach, a home in Palm Springs, this enormous house in San Francisco. And he liked to move. He didn't like to stay in hotels. He loved to buy property and stay. One time I was visiting Catherine and Bing in, uh, in Baja, and when you approached Las Cruces airstrip, it's, a, it's very close to the, to the sides of the mountains. In fact, you can count the needles on the cactus, and it's very scary, bouncy, and it was a small plane. And as I landed, he came down from the house to, to meet me. He said, Lindbergh got three days of confetti for less than that. Well, that was a, that's a totally Bing remark. That's, uh, that's inventive and unique and uh, applicable to the, to the situation. He was very good, a very good writer, wrote wonderful letters. In 1973, Crosby had a happily non-malignant abscess removed from his lung. Thanks to the ministrations of Catherine, a qualified nurse, he recovered swiftly, and in 1976, his voice unimpaired, he played the London Palladium, appearing with his second family, Ted Rogers and Rosemary Clooney. One night, uh, Princess Margaret was in the audience, and she's absolutely letter-perfect on all the Noel Coward lyrics. 
and he was doing Mad Dogs and Englishmen at quite a clip. And he got lost. And he just, he just cut the band off, 40 men, and said, uh, with Her Royal Highness in the audience, I don't believe I'd take a chance on making a mistake on Mr. Coward's lyrics, so I'd like to start again. <laughs> Crosby, the dedicated Republican, also mingled happily enough with Prince Philip on that trip. Back in America, however, more misfortune befell him. He tumbled heavily from a concert stage and crushed a disc in his spine. He was 73, but again with Catherine's help, he recovered well and the following year appeared once more at the Palladium and while in England recorded his last Christmas special for TV. This is a genealogical study of the Crosby family. Is that like a family tree? Well, I'm afraid in our case it might be more like a scruffy old bush. But looking up, looking up, looking up the family tree, I can see, you can see, see our genealogy, all the names and faces, dates and places, telling where and when and who we are, who we are, and how, and how, by now, by now, we managed to get this far. At the end of one of his shows at the Palladium, Crosby did something which for him was not just unusual, but unique. He looked at the audience and put his arms around himself like this and said, I love you. Mouthed that to the audience. And I'd never heard him say that to anybody. As far as the audience was concerned, it was an instant recognition of what he said. And there was a, a scream that went on for a very long time. The Palladium season over, Crosby went alone to Spain for a golf tournament. He played and won his round and then collapsed and died immediately from a massive heart attack. He was 74 and probably couldn't have chosen a better way to go. I was sitting in the hotel and this friend of mine, Bill Fergazi, called me and he said, uh, did you hear the news? I said, no. He said, Bing just died, which was such a shock. And I was numb. I was numb for about two hours. Crosby was buried at an unusually private ceremony in Hollywood, only relatives and very close friends attending. Catherine was much criticized for not giving him the movie star's customary ticker tape funeral. But she really executed his wishes to the letter and I know it would have pleased him enormously to have been buried at dawn with not a person there quiet and exactly how he would have liked it the only thing he would have liked better would be for none of us who have been there we drove to uh, Holy Cross Cemetery and it was just dawn dawn was just breaking and there was a there was a statement made by uh, Geraldo Rivera he said how appropriate that the funeral should be when the blue of the night meets the gold of the day. Waits for me. Bing Crosby's career had spanned 50 years of unbroken success in every medium of public entertainment. As a purveyor of pleasure to strangers, he had no peer. His first family perhaps found him less lovable or even hardly lovable at all. But by the end, he'd made his peace with them, too. We had a moment up at his house one time in, uh, in Hillsboro. And uh, uh, it was a, he, he said, let's take a walk around the grounds. And so I said, OK. So he did. And he started just talking to me about the, whatever. I got the feeling that he all of a sudden he was, I was OK in his eyes, as far as an adult went. And uh, uh, if there was ever going to be an apology, that was as far as it was going to go. That was, was going to be it. So I better accept that. So I did. And uh, the relationship changed from there. It was, it was on much better footing after that. Bing Crosby once suggested as an epitaph for himself, he was an average guy who could carry a tune. But that was a typical piece of Crosby understatement. He was by no means an average guy. He was a most complex guy, a contrasting mixture of shade and light, which meant that he presented different aspects of himself to different people. He could appear gentle and affable or hard and cold, and all these things were part of his nature. Furthermore, he could do a great deal more than simply carry a tune. Again, understating the case, he said, I've stretched a talent that's so thin it's almost transparent over an improbable number of years. Well, the talent was certainly not thin. Whatever he did, he made it look easy, and that in itself takes a considerable talent. As an actor, he was good enough to win an Oscar and establish himself among America's most popular movie stars for two decades. Indeed, it has been said that on film and record, on TV and radio, he gave more pleasure to more people than any other entertainer. And that in itself is a better epitaph than the one Crosby suggested. But best of all, and this is something which his great commercial success tended to obscure, is this. He was by common consent the most influential and the most innovative popular singer of the 20th century. The word great is banded around so casually these days that it's come to mean nothing much more than not bad. 
But if you take it to mean of surpassing excellence, then Crosby the singer was indeed great. I've only I could see her. I was aware I was living with a legend and that somebody that was larger than life. And yet, being in the privacy in his, of his own home and living with him daily, I knew what a totally, utterly simple human being that he was. I like my life was uh, just before he passed away. Somebody asked him who was his best friend. He said Phil Harris, and that uh, that was that's a big thing for me because I loved him. Meet the goal of the day. Someone. Wait for me, and the gold of her hair crowns the blue of her eyes like a halo so tenderly. I only I could see her. Nothing. Oh, how the goal of the day someone waits for